Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our weekly update. I'm pleased, as always, to be joined by Dr. Lawrence Lowe, our Medical Officer of Health, Nancy Dun McDonald Duncan, our Acting Fire Chief and Director of Emergency Management, and Sam Rogers, who's here again, Mississauga's Director of Enforcement, for any questions you may have about enforcement. Before I get started, I want to quickly congratulate the new President of the United States, Joe Biden, and Vice President Kamala Harris on their inauguration earlier today. As we all know, the work ahead of them is immense. Their greatest task will be trying to heal the great divisions in America that have only been widened over the past four years. But I'm truly confident that they will be able to accomplish this. As a woman in politics, I was truly emotional to see Kamala Harris sworn in as vice president. An American woman of color, of South Asian background, has never held such a powerful political position before, and she's truly an inspiration to girls and women right across the entire world. She's a trailblazer in every sense of the word, and seeing her in this incredibly important role gives me great hope for the future. I'm also confident that the new president deeply understands Canada's role as a strategic ally and trading partner. I know that many Mississaugans have important business in the United States, and it is my hope that the new administration will foster an environment that will only build and strengthen these relationships. Like many of you, I'm looking forward to this new chapter in the United States. It's been six days now since the new, new province-wide stay-at-home measures have come into effect. And I'm very happy to report that we've seen an incredibly high level of compliance from both businesses and residents. In fact, this weekend was one of our quietest in terms of ticketing since the onset of the pandemic. Our bylaw officers issued only three tickets to residents for gathering in numbers above the provincial guidelines. I want to thank all residents who continue to follow the advice of public health to stay home, only leave for the essentials, and limit close in-person contact to just the immediate household. Peel Region is now averaging 247 cases per 100,000 with Mississauga averaging 187 cases per 100,000, and that is lower than last week. It is very encouraging news. We are now what Dr. Lowe calls a high plateau, and I'm very hopeful that we are over the large spike in cases that we saw recently due to holiday shopping and holiday gatherings. But this doesn't mean for a second that we can get complacent we have to remain vigilant. The reality is that our hospitals remain in a precarious situation. Trillium has seen a slight decrease in the number of COVID hospitalizations since last week, with the hospital currently dealing with 75 COVID inpatients, with 15 in critical care and another 100 suspected cases. Trillium is still transferring large numbers of patients to other regions because of the steady stream of COVID cases coming in. At Brampton's William Osler Hospital, they're currently dealing with 112 COVID hospitalizations with 20 patients in critical care and another 56 suspected cases. Right now in Peel, there are 21 long-term care homes and 11 retirement homes and 14 group homes or assisted living facilities that are in active outbreak. Protecting our most vulnerable residents must remain our top priority. But there is promising news on this front as well. Peel Public Health has now administered more than 10,500 doses of, of the vaccine to all consenting residents and staff at Peel's 28 long-term care homes and 15 high-risk retirement homes. Trillium Health Partners has vaccinated an additional 9,600 frontline healthcare workers and essential workers. That's a huge victory in our battle against this virus. I want to take a moment to sincerely thank Peel Public Health 
and our Trillium Healthcare partners and the frontline workers for taking part in this truly historic effort. Along with administering the vaccine, our frontline heroes have been testing hundreds of people every day, caring for COVID patients, and continuing to provide both inpatient and emergency care. They've been shouldering so much and continue to show grit, dedication, and compassion as they work tirelessly to keep our community safe. I'd also like to thank Dr. Lowe and his team for being instrumental in this effort, as well as the provincial government for ensuring Peel was prioritized during the first phase of the vaccine rollout. We did learn yesterday that Canada will not be receiving any Pfizer vaccine next week as the company's Belgian plant retools to, to expand its facilities. That means vaccine allocations across Ontario over the next few weeks will be reduced significantly from what had been originally anticipated. This is very disappointing, especially because it means a delay in getting vaccine to other vulnerable groups in our community. But I want to ensure all Mississaugans that I'm doing everything in my power to ensure that even more vaccines do become available when they become available, our community will get a fair share. And that's why along with uh, Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown and Caledon Mayor Alan Thompson, we have sent a letter to Premier Ford asking that the province continue to prioritize Peel in the next phase of the vaccine rollout. Peel has been among the hardest hit regions in the entire country. And it's only fair that we get vaccines that are proportional to our needs. The letter also asked the province to support Mississauga in creating a mass immunization centre to ensure that we have the capacity to administer vaccines quickly and efficiently over the coming months. I will provide an update to residents on this as soon as we hear from the, from the province. Before I bring up Dr Lowe to give his update, I want to talk briefly about a motion I put forward at Council today that was passed unanimously. The motion requests that the province and federal government work together to provide adequate sick pay leave for all workers. I want to thank my council colleagues for passing this motion as it sends another strong message that something needs to happen on this front immediately. In December, a similar motion was passed unanimously at Peel Region Council, and I've been talking about this week after week. In Peel, We've had 204 workplace outbreaks since the onset of the pandemic, with 122 of those in Mississauga alone. 60% of these outbreaks happened in manufacturing, warehouse, and food processing. In total, over 1,500 workers in Peel have contracted COVID-19 through a workplace outbreak. And we know that workplace outbreaks ultimately lead to more household and community spread. The call for mandated sick, uh, paid sick leave is gaining more and more steam, with labour advocates, doctors and other politicians all advocating that something needs to happen immediately. Last week at our monthly meeting of the Ontario Big City Mayors, we also passed a motion asking the province and the federal government to provide enhanced paid sick leave to address the ongoing spread of COVID-19. The reality is, is the current Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit offered by the federal government requires workers to apply for benefits after they're already sick. We know that, that these financial supports can often take weeks to get to the people who need them the most. Workers only qualify if they lose half their weekly work hours, meaning that the people who need to isolate for just a few days while awaiting test results don't actually qualify. Too many of our precariously and temporarily employed workers are also excluded from this benefit. And the reality is that less than a full-time, and that it provides less than a full-time minimum wage job. Mandated paid sick leave, on the other hand, ensures that there is no disruption to workers' wages if they have to isolate or they're sick. There's no application so that the paid sick leave is automatic. On my weekly call with the GTHA mayors, we proposed a concept where the province would mandate 
10 paid sick days for all Ontario workers during the pandemic, with the federal government providing financial support to the employers. That would mean workers could immediately access sick days without any disruption to their incomes. It's simply unacceptable that we continue to ask our essential workers who are keeping our economy running to choose between going to work sick to keep food on the table or lose income while they self-isolate. I may sound like a broken record, but when it comes to this issue, I will keep saying it again and again. Paid sick leave needs to be part of our continued and shared response to this pandemic. I once again urge the province and the federal government to figure out a solution to this as soon as possible. I'm very grateful that the province and the federal government did help Peel get two new isolation centres up and running this week. These new facilities provide free and private hotel rooms for anyone in need of a safe place to isolate. Transportation to and from the centre is provided, along with three, me three daily meals and free Wi-Fi. I want to acknowledge that Mayor Brown has been an incredibly strong advocate uh, for more isolation rooms in Peel. And for weeks, Mayor Brown and I have kept the spotlight on this important issue, and I'm very thankful for that. For you or a loved one that needs a safe place to isolate after receiving a COVID positive test, please call 905-281-1269. I repeat, that's 905-281-1269. Be well and stay safe, Mississauga. And now I would like to invite Dr. Lowe to please come up and provide his update. Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good afternoon. Mississauga's weekly test positivity for COVID-19 currently sits at 9.2%, which represents a drop from last week's rate of 10.5%. The city's incidence rate stands at 187.1 .1 per 100,000, which is just down from 199.1 .1 cases per 100,000 last week. This next week is a critical turning point in our battle against COVID-19. What we are seeing now shows the lingering impact of the holidays, and what we do now will decide what our cases will look like at the end of January and ultimately what our hospitals will be coping with through February. We know that a vaccine is here and I'm grateful that we've managed to give all of our highest risk residents in long-term care and high-risk retirement homes a first dose, especially given our unique position as one of the harder hit communities in Ontario. I know that many have been inquiring about when they might get vaccinated. I'm excited to see such enthusiasm in the community for vaccination, and I thank you for your patience. Unfortunately, current supplies are very tight. The national Pfizer slowdown over the coming weeks will also result in more reductions in available vaccine at our hospitals and clinics. With our hospital partners, this means our focus in the coming weeks is narrowing to ensuring second doses for our most vulnerable residents and those that serve them. At this time, Peel Public Health is anticipating that there likely won't be enough vaccine to support broader community rollout until mid to late March. And that means, for the time being, how we interact still matters, perhaps more than ever. Keeping each other safe and reducing transmission is in all of our hands, and we can bring rates down, keep them down, and give our immunization program a shot at success. We need to dedicate ourselves to this cause and to keeping each other safe. So many are doing the right thing by staying home except for essential reasons, where when you do meet outside the home, you are always distancing, masking, and washing your hands. I also thank everyone for self-isolating if you feel sick. If you are sick and you can't self-isolate safely, please call 905-281-1269, 905-281-1269,
again, that's 905-281-1269, to be considered for referral to a free hotel quality isolation room at one of our voluntary isolation sites here in the region of Peel. Essential workplaces also need inspections, investigations, and protections. Let's provide more resources to the Ministry of Labour to proactively inspect our highest risk sectors. Let's get rapid testing into more workplaces to help stop outbreaks faster. Paid sick days can help workers stay home and self-isolate if they are sick. And protecting our temporary contract and agency workers keeps them safe and stops spread in multiple workplaces if they are unwell. I want to thank Mayor Crombie, Mayor Brown, Mayor Thompson, and all of our regional councillors for their support of this important advocacy to ensure that we can stop transmission and spread in our workplaces. All of this is needed to drive numbers down, to see our community succeed into the summer, and to keep COVID rates under control while we push our vaccine coverage up. The province has assured us that more vaccine and more priority groups will come once the immediate supply challenges are resolved. But for now, we must start our vaccine program with protecting our most vulnerable. It's the ethical and right thing to do. For the time being, that means the rest of us will need to stay patient, to stick to the precautions, and keep this under control for the moment. Thank you for doing your part. I'll pass it back to Mayor, Mayor Crombie. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. And now we're both prepared to take questions from the media. And of course, uh, Sam Rogers, our Director of Enforcement, is here as well. Are there any questions from the media? Hi there. If you can, if you can hear me, I wasn't sure if Daniel reads or if I go ahead. It's Kelly Grant from the Globe and Mail here. Hi, Kelly. Uh, we can hear you. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. Great. Uh, thanks. I actually had a question for Dr. Lowe. Oh, no problem. I'll ask him to come up. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Kelly. Go ahead with your question. Uh, I wanted to ask about the plateauing of cases in Peel Region and wondering if you could expand a little bit more on what you think is working right now. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the question, uh, Kelly. I really think that our plateau, if anything, demonstrates that the broader measures taken to curtail contacts in the community have succeeded at keeping us at a level. And I think if you look at the uh, uh, data that we have on our website at peelregion.ca forward slash coronavirus, and if you also look at the province's own modeling data, Peel has essentially been in a plateau uh, since uh, we brought in the enhanced uh, letter of instruction uh, following our entry into the red zone at the beginning of November. Um, and, uh, you know, save and except for the holiday surge, which we saw through uh, last week and into the weekend, uh, we're now starting to see a return back to a plateau and hopefully uh, a decreasing trend in the weeks to come with the recent measures that have come forward. Um, but it is very clear that we are still seeing this high level of transmission in our community, which really speaks to the idea that after we have, you know, taken away all of the discretionary contacts, after we have really limited and the community has stepped up to keep, keep people safe, there are still our essential workers, there is still transmission happening in those workplaces that remain open that then go back into households and from there back into other essential workplaces. And that ultimately is the answer if you want to solve uh, you know, part of the a significant part of the transmission problem in the communities in Peel, you need to solve that transmission in essential workplaces. Thanks for the question. Follow up question? Kelly, do you have a follow up? Follow up? I, uh, no, that basically covers it for me. Thank you. Perfect. Thank Should you. Anybody else there? Welcome. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Your next question comes from Beatrice Faisman at CP24. Go Hi. ahead, Beatrice. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I don't know if this is better for Mayor Crombie or for Dr. Lowe, but uh, Mayor Crombie, you spoke about workplaces being a, a major source of outbreaks. Today, we've learned from Canada Post confirming to CP24 that 121 of its employees have tested positive at the Dixie Road facility since January 1st. What do you know about this outbreak and how concerned are you about it? 
Well, uh, I'll say, Beatrice, that we're always very concerned when we hear about a workplace out outbreak, especially one so large as Canada Post, and that we're just beginning to learn of the facts. That, in fact, this only came to my attention before coming down to the press conference. I'm not sure if Dr. Lowe is nodding at me that he may have some more information, Beatrice, so I'm going to invite him up to the podium. Yeah, thanks so much, Madam Mayor. Thanks so much, Beatrice, for the question. Uh, certainly, uh, um, what Canada Post has revealed around uh, an outbreak in one of their uh, facilities uh, is just a reminder, just what we have been saying at Peel Public Health around uh, the nature of workplace outbreaks in our community. We certainly know uh, that um, manufacturing, distribution, warehouses, uh, these are high-risk sectors uh, for us to see workplace outbreaks. Uh, and so certainly, uh, you know, this really drives home the message that we've been, uh, we've been saying all along uh, for our essential workers in our community. Ultimately, uh, there is no uh, lockdown or shutdown, and they are ultimately still out there uh, making sure that there's packages delivered and food on the table. So uh, it really drives home the importance of ensuring that uh, they are protected in the midst of this pandemic. Thanks for the question. Follow up. Follow up uh, on that note with Canada Post as well. Uh, they tell uh, CP24 that uh, with the guidance from Peel Public Health, they started testing uh, employees on one shift inside the Gateway East facility. What kind of a role do you think this kind of testing at a workplace will actually play as, as we move forward through this pandemic to try to actually find perhaps asymptomatic people who wouldn't even know that they could be spreading the virus to their colleagues. Exactly. I've just come back to the podium. I'm going to invite Dr. Lowe back, but it's a perfect place to administer those rapid tests, I would think, as well, um, Beatrice. Dr. Lowe? Yes, uh, thanks so much, Madam Mayor. Uh, so certainly, uh, to answer your question in a broad sense, uh, Peel Public Health does inspect all uh, workplace outbreaks that are reported uh, to us. Um, we are very fortunate that, as you know, uh, the Ministry of Health has uh, been um, has been providing uh, rapid tests uh, to workplaces uh, through a number of pilot programs and increasingly making these more available uh, to companies. Um, and in the event that we are in the course of uh, a workplace investigation or outbreak, uh, we, may, uh, we may recommend certainly that rapid testing uh, be deployed. Uh, as you heard from my remarks uh, today, uh, the focus is uh, really on trying to get more uh, rapid testing into these settings to help identify and stop outbreaks uh, sooner. And that goes back to the three points that identified, you know, inspections, investigations, protections. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Steve Cornwell at the Mississauga News. Go ahead, Steve. Crabby, how are you? Hi, Steve. Thank you for joining us again today. Uh, next question about a motion that was passed uh, today at Council was asking uh, the province to look at more stringent controls on big box stores and um, consider controlled uh, and safe reopening of smaller businesses, uh, in the, I guess, uh, across the province, namely in, uh, in Peel. But I'm just wondering, um, based, on what, based on what we've learned today with uh, Dr. Law saying, you know, there's, it seems to be precarious status of, of cases in um, Mississauga, though, improving me. Is it, I'm curious, A, uh, what are your what do you think the reception of this will be with the province? And B, what um, is this? Are you concerned at all about the timing of this? If the city seems to be kind of improving in cases, allowing more potentially, allowing potentially more indoor interactions, if that may kind of. Uh, knock off the, the balance and the success the city seems to be having. Well, thank you, Steve, for the question. As you know, both uh, Councillor Starr and myself were big advocates for limiting the capacity at the big box stores, as well as closing the non-essential aisles and maybe limiting the number of people that could be in a lineup. We were suggesting they use a reservation system similar to we have here at the, at the Celebration Square rink. Uh, but the, the sentiment on our council is that we want to put, we don't think it's the right time to be opening small businesses. Uh, uh, we, we will ask for capacity limitations when the time is right, when things are safer. Um, and I was very, very pleased with the results of this weekend's proactive blitz that was conducted along with the Ministry of Labour, along with uh, Sam Rogers. Sam, I don't know if you want to comment about any of the... I'll ask Sam to come up and comment on it as well, but we were very pleased. Uh, Sam, how many big box stores did you go to? Seven? Six, six big box stores, and uh, all were with a well under capacity limit, so we were very, very pleased. Um, so I'm going to ask Sam to come up and speak to this as well. So the... the uh, 
Are we okay? We're okay. So, uh, so the, the, the sort of the motion itself was tempered a little bit to ask for primarily what we had asked for in the regional motion was to provide the same kinds of supports for small business um, uh, when, they're, when, it, when it is safe to reopen. Sam, over to you, please. Hi, good afternoon, Steve. Uh, yeah, just to build on uh, Mayor Crombie's comments, um, I, I echo her sentiments. I was very pleased with the, with the results of the big box stores in Mississauga. I also have to say it wasn't much of a surprise uh, because leading up to the you know, multi-ministry task force announcement of the big box store blitz this past weekend, we had been spending you know, weeks if not months ahead of time proactively inspecting all business types but including big box stores and prior to the blitz we had actually gone out and done uh, an audit on capacity limitations based on the new regulations to confirm exactly how many you know people that 25 percent capacity limit it translated to uh, that was reflected in the motion today at council um, and the numbers you know five to seven hundred people depending on the size of the big box store so just based on those numbers alone uh, there's obviously some potential for crowding at choke points, aisles, uh, checkout points, which was uh, addressed by Mayor Crombie earlier on potentially, uh, you know, tighter restrictions in those facilities. So my follow-up question is actually for Dr. Lowe. Okay, we'll call Dr. Lowe to the podium. Thank you, Steve. Go ahead with your question. Dr. Lowe, uh, just, I just wanted to get your kind of take on this as well. I mean, uh, based on what you said, it seems like um, the city is obviously in an important moment right now in terms of where the cases continue to go down or they may go up. So I'm just curious if it's, the motion itself does uh, ask for consideration of controlled and safe reopening or controlled uh, reopening of uh, smaller businesses. So I'm just curious if you think that this is the time to kind of be entertaining more potentially indoor interactions uh, in Peel. Uh, you know, I, it, I think the biggest thing is just to look at the overall timeline by which any uh, changes would be coming into effect. Uh, certainly at this time, at this very moment, uh, it would uh, certainly not be recommended uh, in the sense that we do remain approximately uh, six times above uh, the threshold for the red control category. Uh, that said, uh, we also do know that uh, there is a glimmer of hope. Uh, we have seen a, a drop uh, both in uh, the cases but also related testing and, not, and likely testing not as a result of any uh, laboratory error or technical issue, as I understand. So that means that either uh, people are not seeking it uh, because they are staying home or they're not seeking it because there's uh, less of a need for it. So I think there's... Um, it's too early to say one way or the other where things are going to be going uh, in the next uh, two to four weeks, but at least at this moment it would be very difficult, I would, I, I would think, uh, to scientifically support any broadening or opening of increasing contacts, um, but at the very least uh, we would need to continuously monitor, as we have been, to ensure that all of our trends, not just with cases but also hospitalizations, hospital health care capacity, tracing capacity and testing capacity, are all going in the right direction in the same way that we exited the first wave uh, in uh, summer last year. Thanks so much for the question, Steve. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Vioza Sai at the pointer. Go ahead, Vioza. Hi, Mayor Crombie, hope you're well. Uh, I, I wanted to build upon the question earlier about rapid testing. I'm, I'm wondering if rapid tests have been deployed to any industrial settings at all in Mississauga and what the communication with the province has been on that front. You know what, I'm going to uh, defer this to Dr. Lowe, but Viosa, if I might just say a warmest congratulations on the success the Pointer has seen this week on being announced as one of the most, on the top 50 list of McLean's and uh, the significant groundbreaking work that you have done as a small independent business. So congratulations to yourself and the management team led by San Graywall, so con congrats. And uh, rapid testing, I think is the appropriate to use in large settings, large congregate settings like places of uh, employment, uh, warehouses, uh, processing plants, food processing plants, manufacturing sites. I think, you know, the faster we can deploy those to those settings, the better for us. So, Dr. Dr. Lowe, if you'd like to comment, please. Yeah. So, thanks so much, Vioza, for the question. Um, 
You know, absolutely. I think there's no question that uh, if, the, if, if it's deployed correctly with the right population in certain settings, uh, it can help us identify if there has been undetected spread uh, in the course of, uh, of an outbreak. We do know that this is a disease that spreads very insidiously. Uh, it, uh, on occasion, can spread from person to person asymptomatically, hence the masks and all the other pieces with source control. Um, so, uh, obviously, in an outbreak, there are individuals who would uh, maybe be at higher risk, who would absolutely need to be tested with traditional testing uh, mechanisms, but also just as a further fail-safe in terms of looking uh, at uh, additional, um, additional potential spread within a facility beyond uh, the initial uh, cases and contacts that have been managed in a cluster. The idea would be that to, to then uh, um, to try to de deploy things uh, in a bit of a concentric circle around the cases and clusters that have been initially identified. Thanks for the question. Thank you. My follow-up is actually for you, Dr. Lung, uh, and thanks for the kind words uh, about the pointer. I'll pass that to my boss. Um, so this morning, Branton Council passed a motion making masks mandatory at outdoor amenities like ice rinks and toboggan hills. Other regions have closed these facilities. I was just wondering if you could give your perspective on if it's safe to use these amenities without a mask, if capacity limits are respected, and how does region hopping factor into the decision to leave these amenities open? Uh, so, it, I, you know, it's a great question. I think uh, from our perspective here at the Region Appeal, we do know uh, that uh, it is ultimately trying to balance uh, outdoor recreation and an opportunity uh, for individuals to exercise, which remains an essential reason to be out of one's home. Uh, we do also know, at least in certain outdoor activities, uh, there may be uh, closed um, situations where you may be coming in contact with people, uh, you know, with, within, uh, you know, six feet uh, on a more regular basis, and especially with evidence of both uh, prolonged as well as cumulative uh, exposure potentially leading to transmission. Uh, you know, the recommendation that masks be considered in settings such as that, as such as these, where you might be uh, continuously exposed, uh, be considered. So yes, certainly something like an ice rink where there's the same number of people who are there uh, for 45 minutes. Uh, you know, certainly there's other jurisdictions in the Greater Toronto Area uh, that have uh, tried to strike that balance in terms of adding that additional layer of protection. Um, certainly region hopping has always been a challenge or a problem, but I, uh, you know, I imagine there are ways uh, for municipalities to address that or combat that, uh, you know, uh, through their booking mechanisms or reservation pieces. So I, I can't necessarily speak to that specifically. Um, but certainly the science and suggestion is, is uh, for a layer of added protection, and it's always been this recommendation, if you are unable to maintain, you know, two meters of distances, distance e even outside, uh, that you should be wearing a mask, uh, and especially if you're not consistently two meters away from someone. So uh, that, that recommendation hasn't changed. Thanks for the question. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Ashley Newport at Saga. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, Hi Mayor Crombie. Hi, Ashley. So um, actually, uh, my question is going to follow up a bit on uh, Vioza's uh, question, because I know that uh, yes, Brandon did um, debate today whether or not they should make masks uh, mandatory in outdoor areas. Um, I know earlier you told us that Mississauga has absolutely no intentions of closing any of its outdoor areas, like Toboggan Hills and Rinks. Um, are you considering, or do you see yourself considering actually implementing um, a law or bylaw that will require anyone using a city Toboggan Hill or a city um, outdoor ice rink to wear a mask the whole time instead of just just um, the not able to social distance? Is that something that you're thinking about or talking about? Um, Ashley, I will, I will tell you that that issue did not come up at our council today. I think our advice is still to maintain uh, a safe physical distance. I think if you're wearing a mask outside and, uh, and cannot safely distance, of, I mean, if you cannot safely distance, of course you should be wearing a mask. Uh, and that's rule number one. Um, but if you can, I think that uh, there's still the fresh air we all enjoy and like to get a little bit of when we're outdoors. So it did not. It did not come up at our council meeting. Um, we have not seen the kinds of um, um, what's the word? Um, not high high amount of pedestrian traffic, uh, congestion at the toboggan hills and the rinks, other than in the lineups. So uh, we have made it sure that the lineups are safely spaced, that we're, they're line allocate, they're aligned, they're well lined, and that our enforcement is out there to ensure that uh, no one is breaking the line. So we have not considered uh, requiring masking for outdoors. Um, uh, I don't know if Dr. Sirley want to do that further. He says he said he said his piece on that. We have not considered it yet, Ashley, and I'm not sure that we will. I think as long as you can safely physically distance, that's the key. But if you cannot, then of course. 
Thank you. And uh, my follow-up question is about uh, the um, inspections that took place uh, over the weekend. I know you mentioned that, I know the province was inspecting uh, big box stores in hot spots. I know you mentioned that the city was really impressed that, you know, all the places that uh, city bylaw officers inspected seemed to be uh, following rules, following protocols. Um, I was wondering if you know of any big box stores that might have received any um, fines, or anything from the province um, over the weekend? And um, if so, if you plan on um, following in the footsteps of other jurisdictions and um, publishing their names. Um, I'm not aware of any. However, on the GTHA mayor's call on Monday, Chair Wayne Emerson mentioned that he thought there had been some up in York Region, although didn't list them specifically. Sam, do you want to refer to that? Yeah, I'm going to invite Sam Rogers up. He may have a little bit more information than I have. Thank you. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Just to build on that, um, the multi-ministry task force, so led by the Ministry of Labour along with enforcement officers from my team and Peel Health public inspectors were, the, were, the, were conducting the joint uh, blitz this, this weekend. Um, we, we did receive information from uh, the ministry task force that a total of 51 premises were inspected in Peel by this task force over the weekend. 11 premises were found to be in contravention, and five tickets and nine uh, occupational health and safety orders were issued. None of those were issued in the city of Mississauga, so I can't provide you with specific details as to where they were issued or uh, whether or not they were at a big box store. Um, but quite active, uh, more or less in line with what we're hearing provincially, which was about 69 to 70% compliance of the uh, weekend enforcement blitz. Thank Your you. final question comes from comes from Khaled Salama at My Second Home TV. Go ahead, Khaled. Thank you. Mayor Trombi, how are you? Welcome, Khaled. I'm very well. Trying to keep safe. Uh, yes, please do. Uh, regarding the free isolation centers, can you please elaborate on the capacity of both sites, uh, criteria to join those sites, and what kind of transportation you are providing? Is it protected or um, I don't know? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Lowe to directly come and address this. I have seen the photos and they look like very lovely accommodations, uh, very comfortable and very safe. Um, and we have given out the phone number. Uh, should you need the isolation center, uh, call 905 281 one two six nine, and with, with with respect to the capacity, I, I believe it was a hundred in each one, a hundred uh, capacity of uh, capacity limit of one hundred in each of the facilities. And do we know anything about transportation, Dr. Lowe? I'm going to ask Dr. Lowe to speak to the transportation question. Thank Excuse you. Me. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks, uh, Colin, for the question. Yeah. So there's. Uh, three facilities that uh, serve uh, Northeast Brampton, uh, Southeast Brampton and Malton, and also uh, Central Peel. Uh, and uh, amongst the three facilities, there's uh, approximately 300 beds uh, spread between them. Um, and then certainly uh, private transportation, so I believe it is uh, it's taxi, uh, is provided uh, to and from the site. And uh, as uh, Mayor Crombie identified, uh, it's uh, hotel quality accommodation, it's safe, secure, uh, meals are included, and there are medical staff uh, that are also on site to assist. Thanks for the question. Oh, very well. Wait, uh, wait Dr. Lowe, please. Uh, yeah, thank All you right. so much. Uh, over the past years, uh, Madam Mayor and yourself were asking for uh, mass vaccination centers here in Pitt. Uh, first of all, any response? And if you also can highlight why we don't have uh, not receiving any new vaccines from Pfizer. Do we shut down the uh, storage facilities, especially they need ultra, uh, ultra cool uh, storage? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Khaled. Uh, certainly from what we understand from our federal partners who are in charge of procurement, uh, the Pfizer slowdown is due to a retooling of their manufacturing plant uh, in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, the goal is, as I understand it, to increase, uh, basically double uh, the number of doses they can produce of vaccine this year. 
uh, but that necessitates, as I understand, a, a four-week uh, closure during which uh, we will see impacts. Uh, it is worth noting uh, that there are also Pfizer facilities in the United States uh, that are producing a vaccination, uh, including one in Michigan, um, but that uh, at this current time, uh, U.S. regulations do not permit export uh, of vaccine uh, to uh, Canada or outside of the United States. Um, and so uh, this, this is why, as I understand it from our federal, all this is under, from my understanding from our federal partners, uh, this is why we're seeing this impact at this time. Um, and you know, the hope is certainly that as we get more supply, uh, I had the, pr uh, the uh, privilege of presenting our initial uh, preliminary appeal mass vaccination plan uh, to council last Thursday. Uh, we are planning for a number of mass vaccination sites uh, and uh, we're originally on track to start uh, delivering them to our high-risk populations, uh, the staff that serve them. Uh, as of uh, early February, of course, this timeline may be pushed back a little bit with the, uh, with the new uh, announcement of the delay. Um, but over time, we are aiming to uh, open uh, at least three uh, mass vaccination sites, one in each of Mississauga, Brampton, and uh, Caledon. Uh, so River Grove in Mississauga, Century Gardens in Brampton, and Caledon East Community Center in uh, Caledon. Um, but those will be three, and we'll certainly see where we go from there, as well as distributing through mobile, uh, on-site, um, primary care, and pharmacy channels. Uh, we're continuing to work with our hospital and healthcare partners uh, to bring this to reality, uh, especially when more supply is anticipated to start coming uh, as of mid to late March at uh, this time. So uh, I, I'm sure um, Mayor Crombie may have uh, other uh, additional things that she would like to add uh, on the vaccination rollout, so I'll pass it back to her. And thank you very much, Kelly, for the question. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, but as usual, I think you've covered it quite adequately. Thank you. We'll uh, obviously been asking the Premier to prioritize uh, the regions such as Peel that have the greatest need, um, and uh, we, we think that's necessary and the ethical thing to do. That wraps up the press conference for today. On behalf of Mayor Crombie, I thank you all for attending. Thank you all.